Welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and each episode, I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, We'll hear from Pat Williams, the former director of admissions at the United States Naval Academy, about how admissions works at the United States Naval Academy. Hi, Pat. How are you today? Hi, Ellen. I am fine. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me today. Of course. It's very exciting. This is kind of like the first of this type of episode that we've done. So just first of all, could you please tell me a little bit about yourself, um, your background, how you got into admissions? Of course. I am a retired Navy captain. I served 35 years on active duty in the Navy. Five years I was enlisted, which is, I did some administrative type work. I was a yeoman. And then as an E6, I did go off to officer candidate school where I became an officer in the human resources arena. So I did the manpower and requirements. I did some financial management and audit. I also did some work in diversity and inclusion. And as a part of my Navy career, I ended up, you know, we go where we're ordered, right? I got duty station um, orders to the Naval Academy. And not being a Naval Academy grad, I'm thinking, wait, why me? And so they were looking for some diversity of thought along with um, the other folks who work at the Naval Academy. And I went there as the director of admissions and just really fell in love with the whole notion of higher education and training these young folks to as they went through college. So that's kind of how I ended up in admissions. And then I transitioned from the Navy a few years ago, and I'm currently a program director for engagement and career transition at the Military Officers Association of America. It's a nonprofit that's focused on really advocating for and serving those who serve our nation. And I am a career transition specialist there. And I'm really glad to be here today. So thank you for having me and thank you all for listening. Of course, that's fantastic. And then, so what did your role entail at the United States Naval Academy? Wow, I led the Office of Admissions staff towards an on, all encompassing, a targeted, really a targeted outreach effort, a strategy that was really designed to begin attracting young students as early as middle school, including those from underrepresented congressional districts, you know, mentoring those students, reaching out to them, and ultimately encouraging them to accept a Naval Academy offer of appointment. And as Director of Admissions, I served on the 17-member admissions board. I served on the Character Review Committee. I served on the Academy Effectiveness Board. I also served on the International Admissions Board. And my role did, did include the oversight of the entire recruitment, the selection, appointment of all midshipmen students to the Naval Academy. I supervise over 50 civilian and military staff members as we engage in our effort to recruit and attract America's best and brightest to one of our service academies. And it was a fun time that I had. I also you know, was responsible for over a million dollars in a program budget for admissions that we spent solely on outreach and efforts to engage young people to be interested in the service academy. Now, I think a general audience isn't as aware, perhaps, of what a service academy is. So do you want to give us a quick definition for that? Sure. Well, there are several. There's, of course, the Naval Academy. There are also Army, West Point, um, up in, in New York. You also have the Coast Guard Academy and the Merchant Marine Academy and the Air Force Academy. So as the undergraduate college of the Naval Service, the Naval Academy prepares young men and women to become professional officers of competence, of character, of compassion in the United States Navy or the United States Marine Corps. So when they leave the Army, West Point, they can go be Army officers. But when they leave the Naval Academy, they can be in the Navy or the Marine Corps. So it's both the sea services. And our students are on active duty. They're called midshipmen. So you'll hear me refer to them as midshipmen, but they are on active duty. And all students who attend the Naval Academy or any service academy do so on a full scholarship. The Navy, the Army, the Air Force, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine Academy, they pay 100% of tuition, room and board, and medical and dental care costs of all Naval Academy midshipmen. In addition, they receive a little over $1,000 in stipend per month, which that $1,000 basically covers things you can think about like a barber or um, laundry, cobbler services, activity fees, the yearbook, and other services. 
But then they also get a little over $100 a month in petty cash to spend. And that does increase as they go from a plebe, as we call them, to uh, seniors and in their fourth year, final year of school. And then of course, they get a guaranteed job upon graduation. So all of these benefits are included in the academy experience in return for five years of active duty service. They are they get that job, but they are required <clears throat> to serve. They attend the academy in any one of the service academies for four years. And while they all graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree, there are 25 academic majors at the Naval Academy and those students also earn their commissions in, as ensigns in the Navy or second lieutenants in the Marine Corps. And then, of course, again, they are required to serve five years on active duty in the Navy or the Marine Corps. And incidentally, I really love the T-shirt that we had, and I think they still have it. On the front of it, it said, not college. It's really so much more. Just think about it. This past Friday, the President of the United States spoke at the Naval Academy graduation and commissioning, where he not only talked about the trials and the tribulations and the unique experiences they faced as they went through their three, the last two, three years during this global pandemic, but what they now face as these young men and women begin their Navy and Marine Corps careers in defense of our great nation, often facing the unimaginable unimaginable right out of college. So the goal of the academy, of course, and, and like the Naval Academy, like the other service academies has really remained the same for the Navy. And that is we are meeting the demand signal of the fleet or the United States Navy with officers. So about a third of the total officer sessions for the United States Navy each year comes from the Naval Academy. And they are trained morally, mentally, physically, to be the leaders of the Navy and Marine Corps and the nation. And of course, at the Naval Academy, we seek to develop ethical leaders of character and consequence who are ready to lead in the fleet as the Navy remains a relevant and forward operating force in today's uncertain environment. With that said though, Naval Academy students, Service Academy students are just like at their peers at other schools. They're concerned about their education and about the future, but we're just training officers to go and serve in this great nation of ours. And for those who don't know, the United States Naval Academy is very highly ranked. Their acceptance rate is about 9%. So what are the factors that make it such a competitive institution? Uh, applicants who qualify, or mission, qualify for admissions are categorized by a couple things. One is outstanding achievement, as you might imagine. Those students who have an outstanding academic record will often receive a letter of assurance early in the year. This letter does indicate the intent to extend an offer of an appointment, and they could receive this as early as September of their senior year. They must be board qualified, and so those students who do not get that early offer, those cream of the crop students, they may get um, selected from their nominating source. So of the 3,000 students who typically are fully qualified to um, the Naval Academy, about 1,400 of those will receive an offer of appointment for the Naval Academy. And then approximately 1,200 or so of those will become midshipmen. The Naval Academy uses a rolling admissions selection process. And most of the candidates, like with many schools, will be notified by the April 15th timeframe. So you have to be found whole person qualified by the admissions board that I mentioned that I was a member of. You have to be medically qualified for the Navy, Naval Academy. You have to pass a candidate fitness assessment which is the same for any service academy. So if you pass it for the Navy, then it would be good for West Point as well if you for some reason change your mind and decided to go a different route. You also, for the service academies, you have to receive a nomination from your congressman or your senator or the vice president. There are many sources available. And to improve your chances of board academic admissions board qualifications, your high school preparation should really include mathematics and so often, we find students who are not prepared, but four years of mathematic courses, including a strong foundation in geometry, algebra, trigonometry, courses in pre-calc and calc are also very valuable and highly encouraged. The sciences, you know, each or one year each of chemistry and physics and physics with a lab, if possible. English, you want to have four years of coursework with special attention to the study and the practice of effective writing because that will be tested surveys of American English and American literature are especially helpful as background for the future study of literature. And of course, to further enhance their com competitiveness for admissions, foreign languages are critical, at least two years of a foreign language. History, one full year of US history, world history, European history, any of those will be helpful. 
And introductory computer and typing classes, you'd be surprised, they are recommended because all midshipmen, all of our midshipmen students are required to use, in fact, they're issued a personal computer upon um, entry. And we're often very, very surprised at the number of high school seniors who expressed an interest in the Naval Academy, but they did not have the foundation in their educational background, hence the need to reach students as early as possible even middle school, because if they get to senior year, they've typically waited too late to compete for a Navy League, Navy Academy school or any of those Ivy League schools as well. So you're right, it's very, very competitive. And what kind of students is the Naval Academy looking for? Are these students with a background in like ROTC, Eagle Scouts? Um, can students have like a more of a unique background? Well, that's certainly helpful. It is not required. Some of the basic things is you have to be at least 17 years of age and you can't have passed your 23rd birthday on July 1st. So someone who may get to be 21 or 22 may think, oh, I'm not eligible, but you are, as long as you're not 23 on July 1st of the admissions year uh, or the year that in which you go to induction day or I day as we call it. And you may be in the process of becoming a citizen while applying to the Naval Academy, as long as you are a United States citizen by I day or induction day. You have to be unmarried, you can't be pregnant, and no dependents, so you must not have any legal obligation to support a child or any other individual. Have a valid social security number. You must also be of good moral character. And in thinking about that, the one course I did teach while I was at the Naval Academy, because all post-command commanders are encouraged and asked to teach midshipmen because we bring that practical experience into the classroom. So uh, during both of my tours at the Naval Academy, I was first director of admissions, and that's how I really got into admissions and counseling. And then I was also the chief diversity officer a few years later. And both times I taught youngsters, or we call them youngsters, but they're sophomores in their second year, um, the class ethics and moral reasoning for the naval leader. Thinking about what's right, how do you know, what would you do in that situation? So you want to be a good moral character. And students need to do well throughout their academic years, starting in middle school, ideally the entire time, but they, they also want to take STEM related classes and do well in those classes. And by doing well, I mean A's and B's. And AP and honors classes are great. Just do well in them. If you're going to take an AP and honors class, you want to do well in them as well. And again, by well, I mean A's and B's. I don't mean just coasting by on a C. We often discuss on this podcast how students can demonstrate school fit. So what attributes would you say students can explore when they're trying to showcase school fit in their application? You already talked about like moral character. Are there some others? They want to display leadership potential. You don't have to become, you know, and I say potential because a lot of kids think, oh, if I have, I'm, I'm not captain of my team or I'm not this or that, then I won't be able to show those kinds of attributes. But that's not the case. As long as you've got some sort of demonstrated leadership that we can see the potential. Um, so you want to begin the application process as early as junior year, and you want to start to stand out um, in terms of making yourself, you know, competitive. You want to volunteer. If you're not, uh, you know, a high school athlete or on the sports team or anything like that, you want to have some other volunteer. You want to, you know, become that whole person candidate that most schools will look at. They don't just look at the academic, right? They look at the moral fiber. And, and a lot of in the admissions process, they'll go out on your social media pages. So be mindful of what you're posting on social media so that you can remain competitive and viable no matter what avenue you want to take um, as you look at your future. And the admissions process is almost entirely different than the standards admissions process. So could you just walk us through what the admissions process looks like? You know, um, what does a student do if they decide, you know, I want to go to the U.S. Naval Academy what are their first steps? What are the steps that they follow through all the way to submitting their application? Well, actually, they can begin the application process as early as junior year in high school. And we do encourage that. In fact, the earlier, the better. So you must submit a, what we call a preliminary application to become an official candidate for the next year's class. And you can submit that if you're going to be a senior in the next high school year, are currently a senior in your year of high school. Now, if you're already a senior, you may be a little bit behind the power curve, but it's not too late. I would still encourage you to apply. Or you can also be a current college student looking to transfer, deciding, okay, I've been at this for two or three years, but and I'm not yet 23. I want to apply to the service academies. You can do that too. And of course, upon completion of that preliminary application, the admissions office, where I was director of admissions, will review it, determine your competitiveness <clears throat> for receiving a candidate number, 
And then once you are in receipt of a candidate number, this will then indicate your designation as an official candidate for admissions. And within that candidate letter, once you re receive a number, we'll send you a letter. There will be important instructions to follow on how to proceed with completing that official application. And it's really fourfold. You must complete the application and then the admissions board, you have to qualify at the admissions board and they'll look through your entire academic record. You have to physically qualify, you have to medically qualify, and you also have to obtain that nomination that I mentioned. And it's from an official source, which normally includes US, your, your US representatives or US senators, your congressional district or state, and respectively, whichever one that you wanna use, and then you're the vice president of the United States. And applying to a nomination is similar to applying to a school where you be being personally acquainted is not required, we do er encourage you to apply to all available sources and you're eligible for a number of different sources. We also recommend that you submit that letter of application for your nomination immediately after you complete your preliminary application so that you meet those deadlines. And the Naval Academy program, as with the other service academies, is physically challenging. So we do require all of our candidates to undergo a thorough medical examination. And we also require a candidate fitness assessment which is sort of like a fitness test, a test your fitness and your ability. We, co we evaluate coordination, we evaluate strength, agility, speed, endurance. And if you are accustomed to regular fitness, physical fitness activity, the students have no difficulty um, with this assessment. You know, maintaining a high level of physical fitness during high school is really encouraged because that means you'll be prepared to meet the physical demands of plebe summer, um, just to test their strength and endurance. And then of course, life as a, as a midshipman, because throughout the four years, you're required to um, take those physical assessments. And you're also required to take physical assessments throughout your naval career. You know, like when I was on active duty for those 35 years, I still had to take, you know, outside of the Naval Academy, you still have to take the physical fitness test. So the admissions application is, is very detailed. It also includes, in addition to that candidate fitness assessment, it includes an official interview with what we call a blue and gold officer. So that's really the final step in the process. Um, so this interview, these blue, blue and gold officers are volunteers comprised of either Naval Academy graduates, parents of midshipmen, or other graduates, or just interested people who are interested in seeing young people better themselves. They're located across the nation. They're very well qualified to guide our students who support you towards your final decision and through your midshipman experience. So you reach, reach at any high school, they'll have blue and gold officers, right? So you reach out to them and you'll say, hey, I'm interested in the Naval Academy. And then they'll start working with you. And as part of your admissions record or your admissions application will be that blue and gold officer interview. And so often when you're sitting on the admissions board, you don't know the student, right? You have no idea who the student is, but you use not only the person's application, but the blue and gold officers interview as part of your assessment and trying to determine, does this person have what it takes to one, not only get into the Naval Academy, but also to succeed and be academically successful four years later to graduate and then to go on to serve. Because it's threefold, you've got, got to get into the Academy, you got to get graduate, and then you got to go out in the fleet and relieve folks like me so that we can go off and then you take over. So, um, it, 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 it's, it's, an, it's an involved process, but it's, it's once you get, because it's all online, it's easy to get through. We're in a bit um, of a, a period of transition where a lot of schools have been test optional. They still are test optional, test blind. How do test, for, test scores factor into admissions at the Naval Academy or at these service academies in general? Are they more important than at the average college, less important? In fact, we've had some of the same challenges as, you know, we say not college, but we're very similar in many ways because we too have waived some of the test score, you know, throughout the pandemic have had those same challenges. But test scores are really just a single data point. They're one data point in the assessment of the whole person for interest eligibility and assessment of graduation potential. Because again, we're interested in not only in them getting in, but them graduating as well. So it's really just one, a single data point. The Naval Academy Admissions Board remains committed to a process that has proven to be a fair assessment of the whole student or the whole person as we call them, where academic rigor, life experiences, unique circumstances, volunteer work, and leadership ability or a, a leadership attributes and potential 
will also be evaluated. So, and there's no specific GPA or grade point average minimum. You should though at least strive to be in the top 20% of your high school class. That'll make you more competitive, whether you're looking at a Naval Academy or any other college of choice. What are some misconceptions that you encounter about the U.S. Naval Academy, the service academies, and their admissions process? Oh, that's very interesting. One is that it's not for everyone, right? Or they think, oh, I can't get into the Naval Academy, or that you have to know someone either in the military or in politics to get that nomination, neither of which is true. And that may, um, and the other thing is that you may not be successful there. You know, I don't have the best academic record, or, or I, I'm not sure about this. When reality, there's routinely an 88% or better graduation rate. And, and they do this in four years. So not only do they get in, they succeed. We work with them, with them throughout the entire process and they graduate uh, and then they go on to serve in the fleet. So I think it's the misconception that everybody, it's not for everybody. You can apply and be successful to the service academies. When you received the applications, what was the process? Can you like walk me through from your point of view of how you would review each application? So really a day in the life of an admission officer centers around the candidate engagement program. So we have, you know, I was the director of the office and then you, I had an admissions officers that really work each part of the country. So it was really candidate engagement that they were, they were really, which was designed to identify those highly quality, qualified candidates early on in the admission cycle. And then through continuous interaction with the Naval Academy, during, especially during their senior year, these identified candidates are encouraged to complete their application. So the goal is really to inspire those students to accept an offer of appointment. So it really begins with what we call a family of schools, you know, within our middle schools, our magnet and STEM high schools with congressional outreach to ensure representatives, those congressional representatives and their staffs are familiar with the nomination process. So we would be responsible for a quick story. I went to see my congressman, right? I'm originally from the state of Mississippi. And so when we were doing these congressional outreach efforts, as we get these applications and the kids don't have a nomination, you can't get into any service academy without a nomination. And so my congressman, I went to see him and he says to me, young lady, have you been to our state recruiting? And we hadn't because let's face it, um, we don't get the best reputation for schools in the state of Mississippi. We do have some great math and science schools where kids do really, really well in them, but we had not. And I said, but sir, I'm ready to change that. So he said, my next Congressional Academy Day where they go out and they host high school students to make them aware of the different opportunities. With well, the next one he held, um, not even 30 miles from my hometown, I joined him and we talk to young people about the different opportunities that was available to them. But we do school visits. Once we see um, a person that may be interested, we do to drum up interest. And then they, that may encourage them to apply. We often have band, Navy band performances, like what we call the Electric Brigade, which is a special, a smaller, more diverse ensemble that does all kinds of music that appeal to many different audiences. And the overarching focus is really highly qualified, technically oriented, diverse candidates from all backgrounds. And when we get those initial applications, we also do sometimes summer in-home visits to try and force that relationship. We will do phone calls to those targeted candidates with those applications in there to try to get them through the application process. Does the average candidate apply to multiple service academies and do they also usually apply to some regular colleges and universities as well? In fact, we encourage them to apply because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? You know, some students, we will say, we will hear them say, since I was seven years old, I've only ever wanted to go to the Naval Academy. Well, what if you're not one of the 11 or 1200 students that we're only going to bring in, you know, no more than 1200 students per year. If you're not one of those students, then what are you going to do next? So we do encourage them to apply to all colleges because you don't have to accept it just because you apply and get in, but we do encourage them to apply. In terms of service academies, we do want you to pick one and decide because you know we don't want to take from the other service academies or vice versa. So we don't like to poach, if you will, but we do encourage them to apply to other schools as well. And many of them apply to all the different service academies and other schools as well. What are the components of the application? You so know, again, feel like, yeah, continue, sorry. It begins with those contacts or prospects who ideally turn into applicants and then official candidates. 
and those candidates who are, as we like to say, triple qualified, then you get their offer of appointment followed by acceptance. And then that, then you show up on I day and ultimately you've got graduation and commissioning four years throughout. So you know, oftentimes the idea is to introduce them, excite them, then continue to communicate and interact with them students throughout. Um, for the application process, a lot of times we have what we call summer seminar. We will also send midshipmen out in terms of engagement and outreach. We'll send them out on operational information vid visits where they will talk to young people, try and encourage them to start their application. And one of the things we have is called the Naval Academy Summer Sem Seminar or our NAS as we call it. It's the first step in really navigating your future towards becoming one of our nation's next generation of leaders. It's a week of immersive practical learning where the candidate actually lives in the dorm where our midshipmen students live, eat in the dining hall where they eat, take the STEM focused classes and engage in a physical fitness test, which becomes part of their official application. And if you are enrolled in your junior year of high school and considering the Naval Academy as your college of choice, then we do recommend you consider applying for summer seminar because that will introduce you to life at the Naval Academy, but it also begins your application. It serves as a preliminary application to the Naval Academy. And then you'll complete that long before your senior year. And you will learn from some of the best midshipmen and our most esteemed faculty. And while serving as director of admissions, I also created an enduring summer STEM camp. That's a similar idea, although it targets younger students to help them get better prepared for that application. So you know, it, it's rising ninth through 11th graders. And again, they spend a week at the Naval Academy with, with these STEM related classes, student workshops, robotics tournaments, Rubik's Cube relay teams, they have wind tunnels, and the chance to operate underwater remote, you know, op remotely operated vehicles, they design underwater gliders, aluminum foil boats, the campers build bridges, they blow up bridges, they even make ice cream from liquid nitrogen. And trust me, I've tasted the ice cream. It's really, really good. So STEM, the STEM camp is really all about exploring and creating and building and making things better. And of course, during our summer STEM program, you do exactly that. You work with students from all over the country. And again, it's it started earlier than the summer seminar. The summer seminar starts in junior year, right? You can only apply when you're a junior and that starts your application. The STEM program starts from ninth through 11th grade, and it starts a little bit early to get you familiar with the application and, and then to start that process. So it's completely online and it's very detailed. So once you get your candidate number, you know, you have that preliminary application that starts with the Naval Academy Summer Seminar. If, you, or if you're fortunate enough to be one of the few students who attend the summer camp, but even if you don't attend summer seminar, you can still begin your application and still apply to the Naval Academy. So it's not a requirement. It's just a nice to have because you get a one week and it's a make or break. That's where they decide, yes, this is definitely for me or no, I'm not interested. I can't do this. I don't want to do this, but it's a great experiential learning. But either way, it starts your, your application and it's very detailed. You do want to maximize your opportunity for admission by paying close attention to the deadlines and keeping track of the application requirements. So for the online application, there are several key elements. For example, we have a personal statement that you're required to submit. And it asks, it asks you two questions. One is why the Naval Academy, right? And then two, describe a character building experience. And you'd be surprised at the number of personal statements that I've read that they would, maybe the students got excited and they just answered one question and they never got to the next one. And, and trust me, admission board members are human, so they notice. So they'll say, well, they didn't answer the first question. I didn't answer the second set question. So what I always encourage students when we're doing that engagement and outreach is to write your personal statement offline in a Word document, read over it, and you, the student, need to write it, not your parent, not your mentor, not your coach. You need to write it. You need to answer both questions. And if it's a school that has more than two questions, answer all the questions that you're asked and read it. And, and like I say, draft it in Word, you know, review it, make sure that there are no errors because that's your one data point. You have the personal statement that you, the student, have written. And then you have that interview that the Blue and Gold also will write about you. Other than those things, unless you've gone to summer seminar and you have that week long, because with that summer seminar program, the midshipmen will write an assessment. They will do um, an interview of you too. So they'll write um, like a recommendation for you as well. But if you don't have that, all they have is that personal statement. So you have to answer the question that you've been asked. And then, of course, I mentioned you have to have a fitness assessment. So if you go to summer seminar, 
you automatically get the fitness assessment. But any school you're um, attending, your blue and gold officer can administer your fitness test. Your coach can administer. Anybody can give you that fitness test. And if you're active in school, you know, whether you're on the track team or playing some sort of sports, you will be physically fit. Your activities record of what you're doing in school, your academic information, of course, the classes that you've taken. Our application also requires recommendations from your math teacher, and it can't be your first grade math teacher, right? The person that you love and you treat it like a mom. It's got to be completed by your previous year or your current year teacher. Same with the English rec. You have to have a recommendation from an English teacher, and it needs to be completed by the previous year or the current year teacher. Then, of course, your high school transcript we request by mail, um, your college transcript if you've done some college, and also, of course, any official SAT or ACT scores. Um, is all part of the application process. And is that summer seminar, is that pretty selective? It is very selective. We do like to bring in a, a wide breadth of students from across the nation, but it's, you know, we get over eight, 9,000 applications and um, we're only looking to bring in usually about six to 700 students per session. And they're usually three one-week sessions. We may have one the first week of June, second week of June, and then the third week of June. So it's pretty selective, but it's a great uh, entry into what you can expect because you live the life of a midshipman. You even live in the dorm that they live in and you get to experience and you get to talk one-on-one -on -one with them. So you can see that real experiential learning. We also do smaller events throughout the year. Like we'll do mini STEM visits throughout the year. We'll do what we call candidate visit weekends where a student may come and um, visit or weekend at the Naval Academy. We do a Midway Museum out in San Diego for the Midway where they spend overnight. Uh, just part of the awareness and outreach effort so the children students know what they're getting into uh, before they commit to a life as a service academy student our outreach efforts also include some brand awareness like our midshipmen will travel our students will actually travel we have midshipmen who are involved in all kinds of activities um, the midshipmen glee club the midshipmen gospel choir they put on amazing concerts. They've also performed across the nation. I was attending one event in St. Louis where they sang for the national anthem for the Dan St. Louis Rams at an NFL game. They also sung the national anthem for the Chicago Bears. So they go out and do all kinds. These are midshipmen. These are students. They do all kinds of things. So, And if a student is rejected for that summer seminar, are they still able to apply for the general admissions? And they are and they should. As I, as I mentioned, you are not required to go to summer seminar. It's a nice to have and you, you want to do it if you can. But if and, and we turn down a lot of students, but that that application still begins your it's still your preliminary application, even though you didn't get in. It puts you on the notice of the admissions officers. So they may very well reach out to you and say, hey, um, Ellen, I see that you didn't get into summer seminar, but would you like to come for a candidate visit weekend you know, or just a shorter visit? You don't spend a week in the summer. And some students, we do it so early in June that they're not even out of school. So they can't come. They want to come, but they can't. So I would encourage them to apply because it puts them on the admissions radar and it begins that preliminary application. But even if you do none of that, you can still apply and, 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 become, and become accepted at the Naval Academy. So it's not a requirement. It's a nice to have. Uh, and a great experience of learning, but you don't have to go to summer seminar to start your application. Well, you mentioned the not responding to both questions in the personal statement, but are there other mistakes that you would often see applicants making in their application? Well, I think the first thing is simply not completing the application. You'd be surprised at the number of folks who started and we reach out to these folks. That's where some of the phone calls come in. I've made cold calls myself. To just students, you just pick a random group of students, you're calling them and like, hey, I'm the director of admissions at the Naval Academy. And they're like, wait, whoa, a director of admissions is calling me? And so the students get a real kick out of it. But yes, some of them, they just do not complete the application. And another huge challenge is not meeting deadlines. For example, the nomination deadlines. And some of those are very early in the year. So we encourage them as soon as they start their preliminary application to also complete that nomination request because you, you don't have to know the person, but you have to request one. And so a lot of them, the deadlines are in October. So that's pretty early in senior year. So I think that's the biggest thing that, that, that people have a challenge is not completing and not meeting the deadlines on time. And you mentioned the letters of recommendation. You mentioned that there's some specific restrictions of a math teacher of the current or past year, English teacher. Um, besides that, what do you look for in letters of recommendation? You know, letters of recommendation are always a unique entity. Generally, one expects letters of recommendations or letters of reference 
and the like to be very supportive of the individual in question. However, what I try and glean from those of recommendation is some sort of established familiarity or established relationship where the author has had some sort of obvious relationship and experience with that candidate and is therefore therefore somewhat of an expert on the candidate because again you're relying on these letter of a rec or recommendation and you're getting you could get 15,000 applications and of those you know three or four thousand could turn into completed applications and you're reading through these things trying to figure out who, who's going to be that lucky you know 1200 or so so you try to glean from that what the relationship was and how they, that came to be so I think letters of recommendation, they go over very well with the admissions board, but it's very clear when you're just out there, you're getting 10,000 letters of recommendation just to think that's going to make a difference. But if you've got one or two hard hitting ones that talk about the core of who you are and what you've done academically, physically, mentally, morally, you know, that, to develop that whole person, that carries a lot of weight with the members who are on the admission boards. You also mentioned about the interview. Um, are there any mistakes that you see often for the interviews or things that you recommend oh students goodness. prepare for? Because I'm, I'm sure high school students, that's probably one of the most stressful aspects is that interview. You know, one of the most impressive young people I ever met, I was, of course, director of admissions, and this was a seventh grader. She came to one of our admissions for me, and she, I'll never forget it, she was dressed in a nice sort of pinkish color business suit as a seventh grader, and her little heels on, and she was dressed professionally, and her, her older brother was who was applying. But she was there to also learn. So I think one of the things that, that students make a mistake, and, and trust me, either the blue and gold officer will write it up in their interview. They show up at my interview and they're in flip. I mean, I get that you're in Southern California and you're loving life. I would be too, right? But you show up in flip-flops and cut off shorts and, and you're not prepared. But so they're looking for you, like, like my job now, I'm a career transition specialist. So I do a marketing yourself for your second career after our military members transition from the military service, then I work with them on their resume and their LinkedIn profile review and how to market themselves for a second career, right? And so the first thing we tell them is show up, whether you're in person or virtual, show up ready for whatever interview you might have. Dress for success. I know it might be tried and tried, but it's really true for so those young people who are meeting those blue and gold officers, even if it's just a polo shirt, you want it maybe polo and khaki or something of that nature. If you don't have a business suit, I get it. But you know, your, whatever your school uniform might be, but take this seriously, take it as serious as you would any job interview and dress the part that you're going to, or whatever you're going to interview, whether that's your blue and gold officer or you know, your candidate fitness assessment, dress, just dress the part and be prepared for it and do be prepared. Practice in advance on your family members, you know, record yourself uh, answering the question that you're going to be asked and just try to get prepared for whatever interview you might be facing. And then the biggest thing is dress the part for it. And transfer students are able to apply, but is there, are there any specific aspects of the application that are unique to transfer applicants or are there any specific considerations that they need, you know, things in their background from their current college that they should be pursuing? You know, it's so funny. Um, during my time as director of admissions, of course, I said, I sat on the international board. We selected and matriculated about 60 international students. So not only can transfer students come in, we bring in international students. And this year, I think the class of 2025 had over 16 international students from countries like, I don't know, Egypt, Fiji, Ghana, Indonesia, all kinds of companies, countries rather, and then we also, during my time, admitted a student who had graduated. I think it might have been New York University, but they had graduated from New York University after four years. And we found that college students doing well in STEM-related classes tend to be very competitive for the Naval Academy. Now, yes, you've graduated or you may be in your second or third year, but you still have to do the full four years. It's not like you can come in as a junior or senior no matter the time you've had at school, you come in and you do four years at the Naval Academy, you graduate in four years and then you go off and serve in the fleet. And for some of the young folks who don't get in when they apply that first time, that's fine. We get people who apply two, three, four, five. One, it shows commitment. It shows due diligence. It shows diligence. And two, we encourage them. I will counsel them. I'll send, I would personally send out a letter, sign director of admissions. Um, and I would say to them, go to a college, a typically a four-year college of your choice, take the same sort of classes you would take as a midshipman, freshman, or plebe, as we call them. Take those classes, the basic, you know, college algebra, pre-calc, English, all the classes you would take as a plebe and do well in them and then reapply the next year. 
And a lot of those students tended to do really, really well. Some of them, they went off to college and they decided, okay, I don't want to apply for Naval Academy and I stay where I am. But some of them who really were committed and wanted to attend did take those, those STEM-related courses and the humanities courses and did well in them. And then they reapplied. So our transfer students tend to be very well prepared because they're a little bit more, more mature. They've been to college before they've experienced. So they have a little bit more success and they tend to also get picked on or selected to be in leadership positions at the Naval Academy. And they tend to do really well in those as well. For students who are in middle school, uh, freshmen, sophomores, maybe they're in elementary school, who knows? Um, how can they build their profile so that by the time they're a junior, they are a really competitive candidate? I think that's a great, a great, great question. Because so often we get seniors who all they wanted to do was come to the Naval Academy, but they found out about it too late. So I would say begin early. It's never too early to begin the art and science of networking. For example, at the Naval Academy, we also have a field admissions counselors located in key areas like Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Atlanta, Houston, New York. And one simple way is to is reach out to these folks, start working with these Naval Academy representatives. And even though you're too young to apply for admissions, you're not too young to start building up your experiences. You wanna have a strong foundation in the math and sciences, whether that's algebra, geometry, trigonometry, pre-calc, calc, all of those things. Again, chemistry and physics with a lab, and again, while there is no minimum GPA, you do want to be in the top 20% of your school. So strive to do the best you can in school. Don't settle for a C and, you know, just strive to be in that top 20% of your class because we're picking the elite. And so if you're up there at the top, then you, you, you have a really good chance of being selected. Take your SAT, ACT as early as you, you know, some of the people take the preliminary tests. So take those so that you can see where you are. And while there is no minimum, Number, if you want to take it again, I would take it as many times as possible to get the score that you want to get that's going to make you more competitive. AP and honors classes or, and IB classes are encouraged. However, again, if you're going to take AP honors or IB courses, that's great, but you want to do well in them. Don't take them and struggle. So we've had that conversation at admissions board. So do well in those classes. And again, by that, I mean A's and B's. You know, it's that well-rounded student that's really competitive, right? So at an early age, you want to be involved in extracurricular activities because, because if you're starting to build your physical fitness, whether you come to a service academy or just a regular college, fitness is, is a good thing, right? You want to have that athletic and non-athletic and still exhibit the high standards of academic excellence in the academic realm. And you want to have some demonstrated leadership potential. And it's not too early to start, even if you're, you know, I don't know, on your softball team or your little league team you know, try to begin developing those leadership potentials. Be active in athletic and non-athletic activities, even if it's some volunteer things you do, you know, community service, giving back. Those all look really, really good to an admissions board when they're taking a look at the whole person, right, that we've talked about, that whole person candidate. Do you have any additional words of wisdom, support to share? Wow. Well, I am really excited to have been here today and talk about admissions because the two things about which I am most passionate is education and opportunity. And although it's a five-year military commitment, graduating from a service academy has lifelong benefits. They are the closest group of alumni I have ever come across. Once they learn that you are an academy grad, they may see your ring or whatever the case may be. They will go to great lengths to assist you, whether it's for a job, recommendations, advice. In fact, I just talked to a member today uh, in, in my current role as transition specialist. He's looking to transition from the military. And he said to me, I talked to a fellow, he's a Naval Academy grad, I am not. Um, I talked to a fellow Naval Academy grad and she told me to do X, Y, Z. So they will, I mean, it's, they're so close. And one of my other colleagues, she went on a trip just Sunday and she graduated, my goodness, 1981 or two or something like, no, 82 or three maybe, a long, long time ago. But she's in touch with her classmates today. I, I, I think there's one, one of my classmates at Mississippi State that I'm in touch with. You know, we send Christmas cards. But these people, they get together, they go to high school, I mean, they're college reunions. They do all kinds. Of, so it's just a phenomenal closeness to me. So, and of course, you know, our key focus there is, is developing those leaders of character, many of whom within days, weeks of graduation will be sent into harm's way in support of our overarching mission to protect the freedoms of, the, of all that we hold near and dear. 
And so I would, I would encourage students to take advantage of the opportunity. You have to earn a valuable educational foundation while you're in school, go to college, even if it's not an elite school like the Naval Academy or one of your Ivy League schools, just go to college somewhere because that will make you more competitive. You will not regret it and it will pay dividends for you for a long time to come. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pat. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight into admissions at the United States Naval Academy. For more information, check out our blog linked in the episode description. If you, let, if you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office. <laughs>